The title of my talk today is SARS-CoV-2 Genome Sequencing as a Window on the Epidemic in Philadelphia. As many of you already know, SARS-CoV-2 is a positive strand, non-segmented RNA genome. It's approximately 30,000 nucleotides. It's a spherical particle enclosed in a lipid envelope. And if you look at the schematic up here, you see all these little green blobs around the periphery. These are the spike proteins. They're involved in mediating the fusion of the viral membrane to the host cellular membrane. But I'll talk about these in a moment. So what are the goals of the SARS-CoV-2 whole genome sequencing analysis project? Well, first, we'd like to assess the origin of the epidemic in Philadelphia using molecular data. We'd also like to know whether patient outcomes are linked to variation in the viral genomes. And third, we also like to assess possible viral polymorphisms at different body sites and see if there's any longitudinal evolution within patients. So before I get started, I just want to say that this is the work of many people. For example, Ron Coleman leads a group that provides us samples from local hospitals. This involves Anya Fitzgerald, Javon Graham Wooten, Lila Kniv. Uh, sequence acquisition is done completely within the Bushman group. This is led by Pasha Hokuma. You see a picture of her at the bottom. Also involving Jonathan Reddy, Young Wa, Abby Glasgow, Eva Roche, Lewis Taylor, and all directed by Frederick Bushman. Analysis was done by myself. And I'd, I'd just like to mention that some of the viral isolates were expanded under BSL-3 condition. And this was done by Henry Lee within Susan Weiss's group. So what did we do? We used an adaptation of the published polar protocol. Basically sample patients, we, excuse me, basically we obtained samples from patients. We use RT-PCR to reverse transcribe SARS-CoV-2 RNA, RNA genomes into double-stranded DNA. We use PCR to amplify, we create Nextera library preps, and we use the aluminum IC platform to sequence those preps. Initially, we started with our own protocol based on six large amplicons, but we found far superior performance using the Arctic primer sets, which are actually 98 amplicons that are closely overlapped with the schematic above. This technique is quite sensitive. We have a quick turnaround. We could go from sample to genome in about 24 hours. It's, it's a bit expensive for routine clinical use, but works very well in our group. So there are a lot of informatics within our pipeline. We see some of the example outputs here on the screen. In the upper left, we see some of the read pileups. We use the Arctic PCR primers and non-overlapping sets. So here we see the read pileups from the odd sets, the even sets, and actually the composite of the two put together with the informatics. Below that, you can see a table. For example, here we see really good read coverage for one patient where a number of samples have more than 98, 99% read coverage. And also our informatics outputs and called variants shown in the grid on the right. So thus far, we've sequenced 42 genomes from 22 patients, all from 10 affiliated hospitals. And this is shown in the figure above. Now this figure is a little dense, so let me walk you through it. On the left-hand side, we see a phylogenetic tree, which shows how the genomes are related to one another. And immediately next to the leaves of the tree, we see a series of symbols that convey the current state of the patient. Now, the large plot dot on the right shows the positions of the different variants that we found within the genomes. Now, we sequenced 42 genomes, so there's 42 rows, one row for each genome. Now, and also, since the dots represent the positions of the variant, they're also color-coded by the nearest gene within the genome. And one thing you might notice right away is that a number of these positions all stack up on top of each other. This is because the same variants are often seen throughout the same different samples. You also may notice a lack of dots down here. Basically, these are our two control samples. These are our repository control. These are actually the Seattle stream, and we're not gonna call variants again itself. And one more thing before I go to the next slide, I also wanna mention here, you see this pile up a variance within spike protein, this corresponds to the D614 gene mutation, which you likely all heard about and I'll discuss next. So the D614 G substitution in the viral spike protein has been suggested to be a super spreader virus by the popular press. This residue is found at the interface between the S1 and S2 subunits of the spike protein shown here. Recently, three papers have shown that, at least in artificial models, that this mutation leads to an increased infectivity of virus particles. And actually, Corber et al. has recently suggested that in numerous locations around the world, this particular strain 
the strain with DG614 is actually increasing over time, and this is shown in the figure up here. But importantly, as I just shown in the plot before, all the strain sequence from Philadelphia have this D614G mutation. So now that we have all this data, we can start asking some questions. One question would be, are there evolving populations at different, at different body sites? Well, we've compared nasopharyngeal, oropharyngeal, saliva, endotracheal aspirate samples, all within patients. We also compared some samples longitudinally as well within patients. While we're still assessing the data, in general, it looks like populations are consistent at different sites. Now, there's no obvious evolution over time within patients at the moment. Another question we could ask, is there any correlation or relationship between genomic structure and patient outcomes? At the moment, there's no obvious clustering or specific polymorphisms associated with outcomes. A third question we could also ask, is there any accumulation of substitutions conferring resistance to remdesivir? Here we see the dot plot that I showed before, and the arrow points to the inferred remdesivir binding position. Uh, thus far, we haven't found any variations in this region of the genome through our 23 excuse me, 42 genomes. So the output of our informatics pipeline is compatible with the next strain platform. Here you see an animation showing the accumulation of genomes from researchers around the world. Soon, you're gonna see some yellow dots show up on this single tree of all the genomes. Oh, here we go, here's the yellow dots. And now these yellow dots represent strains that were identified in New York State. And soon you're going to see some green dots appear, which represent, oh, here comes some, some green dots that represent the genomes that we sequenced here in Philadelphia. You'll notice that the yellow dots are near the green dots, that, which implies that the epidemic in Philadelphia was seeded potentially in part from strains from New York State. All right. Next. In summary, we analyzed 42 viral whole genome sequences from 22 subjects. All the Philadelphia genomes contain the spike D614G substitution and associated additional substitutions characteristic of clade A2A, which matches the New York strain clade. There were no obvious associations between genome variants and outcomes. There was no obvious viral evolution longitudinally or spatially within infected subjects. And also, there's no obvious evolution to a remdesivir, remdesivir resistance. And going forward, we're going to monitor the epidemiology of additional waves of infection in our area and also assess possible functions and new variants that we identify. And again, this is a very large effort, and I would just like to thank everybody involved.